And so can you give me your full name? My name's Jennifer Prue. And Jennifer, we've known each other since 2009, 2010. Yeah. Can you explain <laughs> what it is that your life path is in what you do and what you're passionate about? Well, the timing is great because with this COVID-19, there's all this time to really pause and reflect at what is it that I'm doing. And I'm someone who's had several different roads going at the same time. And all of them uh, do have some qualities in common. And um, I'm the, the, the traveling, the taking people on journeys is about um, all, what, what happens as adults is that we get into this idea, these ideas about who we are and what we're capable of. And when you take somebody like to a developing country and you're moving around constantly, all of a sudden you're met with your perceptions of the world that may or may not be accurate and that we tend to get inside of the boxes in our habits without even knowing it. And so we're meeting the world with fresh eyes, which is, can be really challenging to do it. We did it as children, but as adults, it's much more difficult. And, um, and that process tends to, and doing it together with a group, it tends to open people. So people have all this time to share with each other while they're on a bus driving from one place to the next in a way that because we're, constantly running in our normal lives somehow that collaborative nature and seeing all this new stuff it tends to open people and when people and because we're practicing we're practicing yoga and mindfulness so people have a chance to really pause and reflect in a deep way sometimes they don't even know that's happening while it's happening right. and often when they come back um, their lives are changed you know, I think you, you begin to see what isn't important, like we're seeing right now. So yeah. a whole lot of what isn't important. So that's with the travel. And, and actually the school, the, the yoga and the meditation, that's absolutely tied also into having people look deeply within themselves. How it is that we live in a culture where that's not built in <laughs> to the educational system is beyond me. And um, how the heck do you navigate? The only way you can navigate then is based on what you're told and trends and conditioning, essentially. And that there's this field of potential uh, and this capacity to be able to listen within that is inherent, it's fundamental to being a human being, and we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to do it. And so what's so neat is embodied practice, yoga practice, observing the mind, observing those, those patterns, all of that stuff begins to open into a, a larger field. And then once you've got access to that inner teacher, those tools are always there that will carry you through whatever challenge you're given in life. There's nothing more valuable to me than that. Wow. Wow. And has this, has this time changed anything for you along those ideas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> has it for you? <laughs> yes. I'm in the same place for two months and that hasn't happened in five years. Me too. I've, I've gone to the studio twice since mid-March and that's it. I've been in my yard and in my house wow. with my husband and my kid. And, um, and looking at any variety of scenarios could occur with regard to the studio. Right. And the reality of that. Yeah. And, and looking at having myself been a busy person for the last 10 years, 
what is, where am I going? What, what is worth my time? What is worth time? What is worth energy? How is it that my expression can be deeply impactful? And how much, I don't want to say waste, but extra has been there that needs to go. Yeah. And, and I do feel we're, we are, I mean, obviously we're at a critical time and that all of us are necessary. We're all necessary. And the question is whether we've got the inner internal, um, well, the inner teacher, but the, the resources, the inner resources to be able to meet these moments, uh, these moments and successive future moments um, with, with the climate change situation. You know, and, and like having a meaningful life, if we, we were given these bodies and we were given these talents, these talents were made to be used. So how is it that we do that? amidst just trying to survive, <laughs> just trying to bring, get enough money, you know, to, um, th that there's all those, those questions. So personally, I am looking at refining, um, and delivering, uh, deeper, deeper content. Well, I felt like it, we just got back from the retreat in Bali that I went on with you, uh, which was amazing. And, and I think that's why I couldn't let I couldn't let that thing, the documentary, go without having a piece of you in it, because you talk so much about loving kindness, and you spoke to the 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 heart chakra so much that I feel like that was probably the perfect road for you right now, because. You know, I want to cry because that's where that's where you're at. Well, it is where I'm at, and it's so neat that you see you see it, and yeah. and um, and what I've been working with personally here is with a with a crisis going on, and you know, potentially it, it's even the case that I can lose the studio quite quite easily, actually. Um, and that that it my old coping devices, maybe you've seen this, where my old coping devices would be to try to figure this out. And I will I will go investigating every it's like the rat in the tunnel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> let's try this, let's try this. Well, what if this happens? Like as if I could manipulate reality. Yeah. And that it, it's the birth, the the you know, solution the unfolding won't happen from any of those because if they were going to happen from those different potential tracks in my mind i would have already solved it that's not where to look it's exhausting the head can't solve these problems but the heart trusting in the heart that's it that's it is that what it means to be a warrior, what it means to have courage is to trust in this great unfolding. And it, it, it does require that that's where the warrior is such a great metaphor because it requires a total surrender that we, you know, I feel that I've got to give myself to what, life wants from me instead of <laughs> what I want from life, <laughs> you know? And, and that you, like, that's one of the most beautiful things about meditation and prayer and mindfulness is that to allow the mind to still and to dwell in the heart. How long can we do that? We can do that for moments and then we're back upstairs again. And uh, just being able to sit in our hearts is, it, it sure feels a lot better than running around up here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so in this time, the, the two critical questions um, that I need to ask thematically for the documentary are, um, and I'm, I'm imagining this has probably changed, 
is what does what does healing mean to you? Well, the first thing I think of, and I may not get this quote right, but Ram Dass had something really great. It's not like you're going back to your the state you were in. It's that you're you're moving closer to God. And that's what healing is. And um, I think that's so beautiful because there we're we're obviously we're going to get sick and we're going to die. And things happen along the road. And really hard things happen along the road. Yeah. And and that I I feel that anything can be reconciled with. That's not to say that it's easy, but that our work is to, um, there's a, a quality of atonement, atonement, at one becoming intimate with whatever that wound is, is the process of moving closer to God. So it's not like the body may, may necessarily be fixed. It's that the identification that we had with our prior selves or with the body um, or with the wound is shed in favor of a deeper, deeper connection. You know, that's, that's all I got. No, that's, <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> um, that's a lot. I, I, I want to ask you, do you, do you think, you know, there's religion, which is phenomenal. Like that communal prayer is phenomenal. And then there is doctrine, mm -hmm. which I find a bit frightening at times on a personal level. And then we have these practices um, in yoga, which is not a religion, which is, is a, how would you describe yoga? Well, it's funny because I think actually, because we have, we live in a, a culture that has religion in it, um, and the way our minds work, there's this older paradigm, which is my way is better than yours. And so some of that, that gets inserted into the climate of yoga, where yeah. even, even in the climate of yoga, people treat it like a religion and they, um, look to someone else for a period of time. And then that person invariably fails, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they're left bereft, you know, same story over and over again, because the inner teacher part didn't come into play. And, um, and I think that some of the doctrine of religion is, was, I don't know that it was inherently set up, um, I don't know that that it was thought to that the people that I don't like the idea that that uh, whole religions decided they'd manipulate the masses. I don't think it is like that. I think that um, there was a oh, there was a purpose, there was a point for a long time to look toward look toward the light in a particular direction, and. Um, and that we're we're in a different place now. That that light isn't a function of religion; it is a function of being human. Yeah. And um, that light speaks in different languages, and some of those languages are are built are within religion. You know, like I mean, Joseph Campbell would talk about this a little bit that. If you have a dream and you're Jewish, you may dream in some of the Jewish symbolism. And I may be Chinese and I have the symbolism, but at the heart of that symbolism, we're talking about the same basic themes. But we, we haven't had a language for excavating our own internal processes. I think, therefore, I am Descartes' situation where the mind was looked at as the be all end all. And what we're finding now is that we've got all of this knowledge and wisdom, memory in our tissues. And so when we're moving physically and we're consciously focusing and we're with the breath, something occurs where we have access 
to much more information than we normally would on the hamster wheel, on the conditioning hamster wheel. And we've looked at that because it's sort of new and we don't have a language for it, a common language for it within the culture. We've looked at it as this monumental, like, oh my God, <laughs> it's spiritual. Well, everything potentially, it's like everything spiritual or nothing spiritual, but it's new and it's exciting. And to have that much access to one's body and to be able to move and breathe and focus in such a way that we're, we're literally able to transform the way we see a situation that might have bothered us exponentially 12 minutes ago and now we're practicing and all of a sudden we're connected again that's not a function of religion it's a function of our humanity and we're just discovering it like we ran out of countries to explore and we are the exploration is now here yeah and does that take us back to cowboy yeah i think it does i think well <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> yeah, so now we explore this. Wow. Alone or who, with whomever we're with. And if we've got enough, if we've got the capacity to watch our own patterns in the midst of whether we're alone, whether we're with family members or roommates, what do we have to work with right now? We have this, you know? And, and there's something beautiful about this. This will drive us crazy. This will drive us crazy. And, and there's ways to, uh, there have always been ways to avoid this, some of which we can't do right now, like shopping. People are still drinking. They can drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anything to escape this. Yeah. Well, shopping, gambling, whatever it is, um, OCD, all of the, all of the addiction, yeah. And, and there's another place to go and it's, it's, it's down here, but that does require a certain degree of surrender because we're extremely attached yeah. to this, yeah. to the meat body. And one of the beautiful things that happens in a good practice is that we all of a sudden literally physically realize our connection to the whole thing. And that, you know, one can hope that what we're doing as a species is we're transitioning from feeling like we're this independent disconnected to oh no we're in a field and we are part of the field and wouldn't that be amazing if we were capable of making that transition yeah oh my gosh yeah that's that's such a philosophical way to answer that question i mean it, <laughs> no, it exemplifies it, like it takes it a little bit deeper. I, I want to touch on this because I'm going to use this recording two ways. One, I'm going to have them take the quotes from you for the mm -hmm. documentary, but I want to put this out because um, I think there's some great themes here. So I want to do I want to do two things. One, do you think that your teacher trainings are a way for people to go deeper because they can't go away for the spiritual retreat now. Wait, say that again. Do I think my teacher trainings are a, specifically in this time are a way that people can take the trainings online and because you're not doing, you can't do the retreats right now. Yeah. So this is an interesting question. Some of the feedback we're getting is my classes. Someone just wrote yesterday saying, they're enjoying my classes more now than at, than at the studio. And I, I have a theory about that, yeah. that they're able to go deeper in themselves. And I think it's because I know I, I could stay in my pajamas all day. There's a, there's a self that I, that I put together when I go out into the outer world. And so if a self is going, a little self is going to the studio, they've got this veneer on and then they're practicing and they're looking around and they're seeing who's there and, and there's a self-consciousness. Whereas when you're home, 
I've noticed you probably have too. Yeah. No point. <laughs> like all those clothes in my closet, who was I wearing them for? <laughs> I'm making on my practice. Yeah. So then when I, I meet the screen and, and the, there's something that's much more immediate, there's a, it's a deeper connection in some respects. As far as, and, and it's not, but where it's not is that I can't feel, I can't get the kinesthetic. Yeah. And that, I have to really work hard to touch in. Like I know you, so I know what you feel like. Um, but that's more difficult. Yeah. Uh, I, I would love to say that it is true that our teacher trainings and our all of our online offerings are providing people with a deeper experience, but I can't honestly say that. What I can say is that we're exploring a new medium yeah. and we're going to find out. And that as you know as an art as an artist or as a creative person, my commitment is that no matter what happens, something beautiful will arise. So my hope and my intention is that there is a way in which the work gets communicated and touches people deeply that I would never have anticipated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, just when you were saying that, um, and this is a little off topic, but but I, I want your opinion on it. What you said is you have to really work hard to, to get in because you can't do it kinesthetically. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if this isn't a time where we are reconnecting with that instinctual self energetically. Yes. So we have to be able to see someone and connect with their energy so in-depthly, even though they're not right here. Yeah, I've noticed that um, at toward the end of my online classes, I know people are out there. And where I'm going when I go to close a class or I'm, you know, I'm holding space in a different way. And that's interesting because I think in some respects, our little selves with our little costumes <laughs> meet each other. And so there, that on one hand, the warmth of another human body and their breathing, I can read just like you can. I can read what's happening there. And I, I have, feel as though I have more to work with. Like I'm in syrup. Yeah. And it's yeah. Good. No, syrup. <laughs> much more um i feel like i have my antennas have to be huge and and that the idea that it's a beautiful thing to think about you know hundreds of people all saying namaste at the same time yeah. um, and we all we all knew that as children I, maybe you remember hearing you know half the world is asleep right now and you think about that it was beautiful yeah. but um that all the world is going through this and and that my the and i have it so good but the issues that i have going on are so similar to what so many people are feeling that that's a game changer yeah yeah yeah, yeah totally um how if, if people want to take your classes if they see this how what how, what do they do um, my classes are, uh, so the, the best thing to do is to go to breathetogetheryoga.com and what we've tried to do is make a lot of offerings available. I think in our area, at least in our area, as far as I can tell, there's more than 40, we're working on 50 classes a week available via Zoom. I offer a class that's free or by donation on um, YouTube on Saturday morning, which I'll continue to do. I have three classes and Breathe Together Yoga, you can, you can easily see. We are so far successful at converting all of our workshops to online offerings. So there's so much um, access that people have to, to really deeply work on themselves right now. So the teacher training is also listed on there. Yeah, the teacher training, um, it's all there. It's all there. 
we're finishing up at 200. I'm actually building out, and that's this is between you and me, <laughs> but I'm building out a whole new course. Okay. Um, Wait a minute, say that again. I'm building out a, a meditation course uh, cool. in modules. I want to, I think that, um, that because yoga has been so focused on the physical, that there's a lot of yogis that they're embarrassed. They don't know how to sit. And I, I, I want to go down that road now. Yeah, I will tell you, um, for some reason for me, going to India first and not knowing anything about yoga, the chanting and the sitting is where it started. So it was like crazy. And so pranayama and, and meditation, I, 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 I can't do the same physical things that other people can do. I, I think because one, because I'm very well grounded in my body. <laughs> big bottom and all that's what I'm doing this lifetime uh, but the meditation trips me out it's so great and chanting it's such a shame in so many ways that for a lot of traditionally Christian folks particularly I mean I had huge issues about chanting for years the yogic chanting and wow but it is similar how sometimes in church everyone's singing the hymn maybe it's christmas eve service and you just feel taken by this incredible love deep spiritual love there's something similar in, in chanting that can happen at a hundred percent i'm going to tell you the chanting at the end of the night in the ashram the last thing we do that bhakti yoga blew my heart up when i first got there ghetto kid i am like what is up with all of this by the end you know i am dancing and chanting and i don't even recognize myself and three years later i'm bald-headed dancing <laughs> and i was like who what happened you know to speak to your point about retreats yeah yeah who, who, who is this person that <laughs> covered up so well so yeah i totally get that your website what is your personal website jenniferprue.com p-r-u-g-h